Welcome to part one of the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Measuring Urban Heat Islands and Constructing Heat Vulnerability Indices. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. In this first part of the webinar series, I'll be presenting and demonstrating methods for land surface temperature-based urban heat island mapping. This training is an advanced four-part webinar series covering topics ranging from land surface temperature mapping of urban heat islands to integrating socioeconomic data with satellite imagery for constructing heat vulnerability indices. The final part of the training will present how to use high-resolution satellite-derived heat estimates and gridded population data to map extreme heat exposure worldwide. There will be hands-on exercises in parts one and three for you to work with satellite imagery and learn how to construct your own heat vulnerability indices. Each of the four parts of the training will be one and a half hours in duration, including presentations, lab time in parts one and three, and question and answer sessions. The same content will be presented at two different times each day. Please only sign up for and attend one session per day. All webinar recordings, presentation materials, code, and homework assignment can be accessed from the training page provided at the link below. There will be one homework assignment for this webinar series, comprising questions from all four parts of the training. Be sure to follow the instructions carefully, as some questions will involve submitting screenshots of the results from the hands-on exercises. Answers must be submitted via instructions found on the training page. The due date for the homework assignment is August 25th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all four live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. The following are prerequisites for today's training. If you wish to use today's lab time and work with the JavaScript code we're providing to calculate urban heat islands, you'll need to register an account with Google Earth Engine. Once you've registered an account using a Gmail or .edu email, you'll have access to the shared repository accessing the scripts from the training. The other prerequisites are the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing course and the Satellite Remote Sensing for Urban Heat Islands course presented by RSET in 2020. The first training provided more theoretical background on urban heat islands, while today's training is meant as a refresher while giving participants more time to work with the code and analyze satellite imagery for assessing urban heat islands in your own area of interest. After participating in today's training, attendees will be able to define what an urban heat island is and why it matters to urban planners and public health experts, identify which satellites and sensors can be used for assessing urban heat islands, analyze land surface temperature from Landsat 8 and 9 and Aquamotus using Google Earth Engine, and summarize the limitations of satellite data for understanding urban heat islands. For those unfamiliar with the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, RSET is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. RSET provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, tools, and applications. Trainings are offered online and in person for beginners and advanced practitioners alike. Trainings cover a range of data sets and tools and their application to air quality, agriculture, disasters, land, and water resources management. RSET's goal is to increase the use of earth science remote sensing and model data in decision making through training for professionals in the public and private sector, environmental managers, and policymakers. Trainings are freely available to anyone with an internet connection and conducted either live, instructor-led, or self-guided, such as our Fundamentals to Remote Sensing. Since 2009, the program has reached over 50,000 participants from over 170 countries. All RSET materials are freely available to use and adapt for your curriculum. If you use the methods and data presented in RSET trainings, please acknowledge the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. I'll now present an overview on urban heat islands 
before delving into the applications of satellite remote sensing to monitor this phenomenon. Structures such as buildings, roads, and other infrastructure absorb and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes such as forests and water bodies. Urban areas where these structures are highly concentrated and greenery is limited become islands of higher temperatures relative to outlying areas. These pockets of heat are referred to as heat islands. Differences in temperature has to do with changes in radiative and thermal properties of impervious surfaces. Heat islands form as vegetation is replaced by asphalt and concrete for roads, buildings, and other structures necessary to accommodate growing populations. These surfaces absorb rather than reflect the sun's heat, causing surface temperatures and overall ambient temperature to rise. Displacing trees and vegetation minimizes the natural cooling effects of shading and evaporation of water from soil and leaves. There are different causes for the urban heat island phenomenon. Surface albedo is a measurement of the reflectivity of solar energy on Earth's surface. The measurement varies from zero to one, where a value of zero characterizes a surface that absorbs all incoming energy and a value of one characterizes a surface that reflects all incoming energy. Asphalt, concrete, and brick have very low albedos, meaning they absorb rather than reflect the sun's heat, causing surface temperatures and air temperatures to rise due to their thermal storage capacity. Often, heat islands build throughout the day and become more pronounced after sunset due to the slow release of heat from asphalt, concrete, and brick. Trees, vegetation, and water bodies tend to cool the air by providing shade, transpiring water from plant leaves, and evaporating surface water. When we reduce vegetation in urban areas, there is less shade and moisture than natural landscapes, which contributes to higher temperatures. Vehicles, air conditioning units, buildings, and industrial facilities all emit heat into the urban environment. These sources of anthropogenic waste heat contribute to heat island effects. The dimensions and spacing of buildings within a city influence wind flow and urban materials' ability to absorb and release solar energy. In heavily developed areas, surfaces and structures obstructed by neighboring buildings become large thermal masses that cannot release their heat readily. Calm and clear weather conditions result in more severe heat islands by maximizing the amount of solar energy reaching urban surfaces and minimizing the amount of heat that can be carried away. Conversely, strong winds and cloud cover suppress heat island formation. Geographic features can also impact the heat island effect. Large bodies of water can moderate temperature while nearby mountains can block wind or create wind patterns that pass through a city. Urban heat islands can form during the day or night in small or large cities and in any season of the year. Urban rural temperature differences are often largest during calm, clear evenings. This is because rural areas cool off faster at night than cities, which retain much of the heat stored in roads, buildings, and other structures. As a result, the largest urban rural temperature difference, or maximum heat island effect, is often hours after sunset. The diagram on the right of the slide shows the heat island effect with the orange lines being the temperature in the day and the blue lines being the temperature at night. Parks, open land, and bodies of water create cooler areas within a city. When we speak about the urban heat island effect, it's good to recognize that there are two types of urban heat islands, surface urban heat islands and atmospheric urban heat islands. Surface urban heat islands form because urban surfaces absorb and emit heat to a greater extent than most natural surfaces and tend to be most intense during the day when the sun is shining. Atmospheric urban heat islands form as a, as a result of warmer air in urban areas compared to cooler air in outlying areas. Atmospheric urban heat islands vary much less in intensity than surface heat islands. Surface urban heat islands represent the radiative temperature differences between impervious and natural surfaces, and as previously mentioned, tend to be the most intense during the day when the sun is shining. The magnitude of surface urban heat islands varies with seasons, but it's typically largest in the summer. 
surface urban heat ions are primarily measured in the thermal infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum and are normally observed with radiometers fixed to remote platforms. These remote flat platforms can be satellites, airplanes, meteorological towers, or building rooftops. Satellite thermal remote sensing has the advantage of offering global and seasonal coverage of surface heat ions and provides consistent and repeatable observations of the Earth's surface. Satellites in particular are advantageous for observing surface heat ions at spatial scales ranging from neighborhoods to metropolitan regions and for enabling simultaneous and spatially continuous measurements of surface temperature across a hierarchy of scales. When assessing surface urban heat ions using satellite imagery, the intensity of the heat ion can be characterized by the temperature difference between the average temperature of the urban core window and the average temperature of the rural window, as seen in the equation on this slide. This is the simplest quantitative indicator of the thermal modification imposed by urban areas relative to non-urban areas. When we explore land surface temperature using satellite imagery, we'll provide examples of, of deriving surface urban heat island intensity and how you can calculate this for your own area of interest. So why are urban heat islands a problem? Higher daytime temperatures and reduced nighttime cooling contribute to heat-related deaths and heat-related illnesses. Heat islands can also exacerbate the impact of naturally occurring heat waves, which many of us are currently experiencing this summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Children, older adults, and those with existing health conditions are particularly at risk. Populations with low income are at greater risk of heat-related illnesses due to poor housing conditions, including lack of air conditioning and small living spaces, and inadequate resources to find alternative shelter during a heat wave. Heat islands increase both overall electricity demand as well as peak energy demand. Peak demand generally occurs on hot summer weekday afternoons when offices and homes are running air conditioning systems, lights, and appliances. During extreme heat events, which are exacerbated by heat islands, the increased demand for air conditioning can overload systems and require a utility to institute controlled rolling brownouts or blackouts to avoid power outages. Companies that supply electricity typically rely on fossil fuel power plants to meet much of the demand, which in turn leads to an increase in air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. In addition to their impact on energy-related emissions, elevated temperatures can directly increase the rate of ground-level ozone formation. Ground-level ozone is formed when nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds react in the presence of sunlight and hot weather. High temperatures of pavement and rooftop surfaces can heat up stormwater runoff, which drains into storm sewers and raises water temperatures, and is released into streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. Water temperature affects all aspects of aquatic life, especially the metabolism and reproduction of many aquatic species. Rapid temperature changes in aquatic ecosystems resulting from warm stormwater runoff can be particularly stressful and even fatal to aquatic life. We'll now pivot to focus on how remote sensing can be used to monitor urban heat islands. As stated earlier, Urban heat ions are primarily measured by remote sensing in the thermal infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. When electromagnetic radiation travels through the atmosphere, it may be absorbed or scattered by the constituent particles of the atmosphere. Between approximately 10 to 12 micrometers, the atmosphere has relatively low absorp absorption of infrared radiation emitted by the land surface. It is within this atmospheric window Spaceborne instruments observe the thermal infrared spectral region to derive land surface temperature. The image on the right of the slide shows atmospheric windows where specific types of electromagnetic radiation can freely pass, as well as absorption bands where the atmosphere absorbs and scatters electromagnetic radiation. This slide shows the satellites, sensors, temporal coverage, orbit and swath, spectral bands, spatial resolution, <clears throat> and temporal resolution for each NASA mission we'll be covering in today's case study. We're focusing on the Landsat missions since the United States Geological Survey, or USGS, recently released the Collection 2 archive. This provides a surface temperature product 
so you no longer have to calculate land surface temperature from ancillary data sets, such as emissivity and vegetation indices. We're also focusing on the MODA sensor since it has historic data going back two decades and, provi and provides both day and night surface temperature products. USGS released Landsat Collection 2 in December 2020 and is the second major reprocessing effort on the Landsat archive, resulting in several data product improvements that applied advancements in data processing, algorithm development, and data access and distribution capabilities. Landsat Collection 2 contains level 1 data from Landsat 1 through 9, and science products from Landsats 4 through 9, including scene-based global level 2 surface reflectance and a surface temperature science product. Collection 2 also provides improved radiometric accuracy, improved radiometric calibration, consistent quality assessment bands, among other improvements. Landsat surface temperature measures the Earth's surface temperature in Kelvin and is an important geophysical parameter in global energy balance studies and hydrologic modeling. Surface temperature data are also useful for monitoring crop and vegetation health and extreme heat events such as natural disasters and urban heat island effects. The second land surface temperature product we'll be demonstrating in the case study is MODIS surface temperature from the Aqua satellite. It is also based on thermal infrared bands and comes with a one kilometer spatial resolution. The MODIS land surface temperature product derived from the Aqua mission contains surface temperature for both day and night. Historical data runs from 2002 until present in both daily and eight-day average temporal late latency. Below are some of the benefits of using satellite remote sensing for urban heat islands. Satellites provide continuous spatial coverage compared to in-situ data. They provide data where no systematic in-situ measurements are available, and they augment where in-situ measurements currently are. They provide simultaneous observations of land surface temperature, surface emissivity, and land cover from various satellites. Satellites provide global, timely, consistent data coverage. And thanks to NASA and other space agencies' open source policies, availability of data is freely and publicly available to anybody on the planet. Below are listed some of the limitations of satellite remote sensing for urban heat islands. Data acquisition times of sun-synchronous satellites usually do not coincide with the time of day where the surface urban heat island is at a minimum or maximum. Landsat only provides daytime data, not nighttime data. Optical sensors cannot penetrate clouds or vegetative cover, which can lead to data gaps or a decrease in data utility. The accuracy of land surface temperature estimates depends strongly on corrections for atmospheric effects and on accurate estimate of surface emissivity. Radiate, radiatances received by sensors are influenced by the sensor viewing angle. It is difficult to obtain high spectral, spatial, and temporal resolution with the same instrument. And a large amount of data exists in various spatial and temporal resolutions, file formats, sizes, and from multiple sources. Now that we've had a refresher on urban heat islands and a background on specific satellite missions used to observe urban heat islands, we'll discuss how to use Google Earth Engine to access, analyze, and visualize land surface temperature from Landsat and MODIS. Google Earth Engine is a cloud-based geospatial analysis platform that combines a multi-petabyte catalog of satellite imagery and geospatial datasets with planetary scale analysis capabilities enabling users to visualize and analyze satellite images of the planet. The platform comes with a JavaScript editor, though Python is available as well. It is free to register an account using a Gmail or a .edu email address. To browse the catalog of satellite imagery and geospatial datasets, as well as signing up for a free account, refer to the links below. For resources, resources to learn more about Google Earth Engine, refer to the links to the developer's guide and the developer's group provided on the slide. We're providing you with three scripts of example code to analyze land surface temperature and the surface urban heat island effect using Google Earth Engine. The production chain was fully coded in JavaScript using the code editor platform. Scripts are freely available using the links below. 
All input data sets to the land surface temperature algorithm are obtained from the Google Earth Engine data catalog. Once you've registered an account with Google Earth, with Earth Engine, you'll be able to launch the application using the links provided on the slide. The first script shows how to graph a land surface temperature time series from Landsat 8 and 9 for any user-specified longitude and latitude. The second script shows how to process Landsat-derived surface urban heat island over Washington, D.C., but can be adapted for any other city on the planet. The third script shows how to process MODIS-derived surface urban heat island for both day and night over Washington, D.C., but can also be adapted to any other city on the planet. The code for the three separate scripts has been comment commented throughout explain explaining which parameters need to be changed for your own area of interest. And on this slide, we're providing the main parameters you'll need to modify the variables for in the code. The last four parameters you'll need to create using the geometry tools in the map window or impo importing your own area of interest as an asset. I'll now provide different demos for the three scripts provided to you through Google Earth Engine. The first script we'll walk through shows how to analyze and visualize Landsat surface temperature time series from Landsat 8 over Washington, D.C. from a defined area of interest. To define your area of interest, use the Search Places and Datasets option at the top of the application and type in the name of the city that you're interested in. If I start typing Washington, D.C., it will auto-populate, and when I click on Washington, D.C., you'll notice in the map window that it will automatically pan to the extent of the city, the urban boundary of Washington, D.C. The, the default base map for Earth Engine is the map base map, but you also have options for terrain as well as satellite. If I'm going to go ahead and click on the script now so we can walk through it, this script is for land surface temperature from the Landsat 8 collection, and it's to help to, to drive the surface urban heat island intensity. At the top of the script, we can see that there are three variables that are defined. One is AOI, which stands for area of interest. One is rural, and one is urban. You can notice that they're all polygons, but the rural and urban are multi-polygons. If I pan out a little bit more and I turn on the layers that I have down below, you'll notice that I already delineated each of these polygons by using the uh, draw a rectangle feature as well as the draw a shape feature. And that's how I was able to draw a bounding box, a rectangle for the area of interest, as well as drawing multi-part polygons for the both the urban, which is uh, delineated in magenta, as well as the rural, which is delineated in these multi-part polygons in orange. The important thing here is to be able to characterize and capture the urban core of the city that you're interested in, as well as representative areas outside of the city in the rural area that could be uh, natural landscapes such as forest or agricultural land or a suburban, suburban area which is outside of that urban core, that urban heat island. So it's important that you take your time to be able to capture each of these in the polygons. And then you'll have to rename them in the steps that I showed you before to be able to match the variables that are defined in the script. This top part of the script uh, explains what the script is doing and it also lays out the parameters that you are going to have to change within the script to be able to match it for your own analysis. Each of you will be looking at a different urban area and these are the different parameters that you're going to have to change in the script to be able to get the script to run to do analysis in your own region of interest. Now this first block of code is basically assigning a date range. Uh, this is the day of the year in the city of Washington, D.C. The hottest months of the year are July and August, so we're capturing these day, this date range, this day range, to capture those two months. And then we're also capturing the year range, which is 2013 to 2022, which is the entire Landsat 8 collection. Uh, Landsat 8 launched in 2013. We're also creating a new variable study bounds, and that study bounds is going to capture the variable that we delineated before, which is AOI. Basically, the study bounds is that bounding box that I created, and we're going to give it a new name, which is study bounds, which we'll be able to use later in the code. Lastly, we're going to use display true, which means anytime we pass this variable into any function below, it will automatically display in the map window. This next chunk of code sets the base map. I want the base map to be satellite, so I set that as the default. And then this next chunk of code both sets the map center, so anytime you run the code, it will go to that longitude and latitude, and also set the zoom extent. 
Zoom extent is from 0 to 24, 0 being planetary, and 24 being the finest granularity you can get within the map extent window. Next, we're going to uh, select, we're, actually, we're going to define a variable for two bands. That's the surface temperature band and the quality assessment band. The quality assessment band is the, uh, has different bits contained within each pixel that define which, uh, which of those pixels have both clouds or cloud shadow. And knowing that that QA pixel is what we're going to need to filter out the different clouds and cloud shadows, we're going to create a function in order to do so. So anything that we're going to pass this function into, or I'm sorry, pass any argument into this function, we'll be able to remove any pixels that have clouds or cloud shadow. This next chunk of code is going to define a variable to capture the entire Landsat, Landsat 8, Collection 2, Tier 1, Level 2. Uh, this is the latest collection that we spoke of earlier in the presentation. We're going to select the surface temperature band and the quality assessment pixel bound, and we're going to filter it and mask it by the function and the variables that we defined above. Next, we're going to filter that collection to any of the Landsat scenes that have less than 20% cloud cover. And then we're going to print that output to the console window. And you'll see that when I run the script, when I click run, you'll be able to see that. Next, we're going to create a function to apply scaling factors to get the, uh, to get the temperature in Kelvin, and then also to get the temperature uh, in Celsius because ultimately what I'm trying to do with this code is view the temperature, land surface temperature, in degrees Celsius. And then again, we're going to print that to the console window. This is just doing a gut check to know that the code is doing what you want it to do as you're writing it. And next thing we're going to do, we're going to actually uh, map, we're going to define a variable to actually apply those scale factors to that image collection. And then this next chunk of code is really calculating the average surface temperature across the Landsat collection for those months of July, uh, July and August. So again, we're going to create a variable that's going to create the average uh, surface temperature for each pixel across that collection for those two months. And then we're going to clip that to the uh, area of interest, our study bounds. And then we're going to uh, print that, use a print statement so that we can see that the code is working. And next thing we're going to do is we're going to select just the surface temperature band. And then we're going to uh, define a variable that is going to create a histogram and pass that variable into the histogram. So we're only going to display the surface temperature values. And we're only going to display those values within the study bounds. And this next line of code is actually going to print that histogram so we can see the histogram in the console. I like to use histograms because it's a good way of viewing the range of values, in this case, uh, land surface temperature, and it's a good way of just looking at the spread, the range of values, so you can uh, do statistics and do further analysis, or you can also use that for visualization purposes. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually uh, use this map add uh, map.addLayer, and we're going to add the mapped layer, the filtered map layer to the map window, and we're going to map, uh, we're actually going to display or visualize just the surface temperature using these min and max values and using this palette. And we're going to give the map, when it appears down here, the name surface temperature. And we're going to use the display, a variable that we defined above, saying, yes, we do want this to display in the map window anytime you run the code. This next chunk of code is going to calculate statistics, specifically statistics within that average pixel value for July and August for the entire Landsat collection with all bad pixels, pixels that are cloudy or have cloud shadow. All of those have been removed. It's the average surface temperature. And now what we want to do is we want to take the average temperature just within the urban area. And this will help us to be able to derive the, uh, the urban heat island intensity. So this is going to create statistics just for the average within uh, these pixels, which is the urban. And then the next thing we're going to do is this next line of code is going to take the average for all of the uh, pixels, which are in the, uh, the rural polygons that we created. So it's just a way of, of generating statistics. And for both of those, we're going to print the results to the console window so we can look at those statistics. So when I click Run, you're going to see that it's going to pan to the, uh, to the zoom extent that I defined earlier. And it's also going to generate a land surface temperature map 
of the study area, which I delineated, the area of interest, and it's also showing areas in red, which are hot, and areas in blue, which are, are, are cooler than the, uh, the areas in red, which are more impervious and built up areas within the map window. And it also uh, set the center on the longitude and latitude that we defined. And we can see if we zoom into downtown Los Angeles, that um, we can see that a lot of areas in the downtown area are quite warmer than surrounding areas, but we can also see areas like the Anacostia River here and the Potomac River, Rock Creek Park, areas of uh, both water and forest, Greenbelt Park here. So these uh, natural areas, which are more forested or riparian, are much cooler than the more built up, and especially this downtown area here and in Northern Virginia here. So if I go to the output, we can start looking at the histogram here. I can actually click on this pop out and we can view that in a different tab. So we can start looking at the spread of values. The value on top is actually the degrees in Celsius centigrade. And we can see the range down below. So the range is really from 27 to around 50. Uh, but um, anyway, going back to the code, if we drill down a little bit uh, deeper, we can start looking at the statistics that we output. This first one is going to be the min, uh, mean, min, and max for the urban area. And to drill down to that, we're going to click the drop down and we're going to go to features and then zero and then one more time to properties. And we can see that we have the surface temperature, both the max, min, and mean. Uh, I'm interested in the mean because I'm going to use that to derive the surface urban heat island intensity, but the other statistics are there as well. And again, that was for the uh, urban areas in Washington, which are defined by this polygon here. And then next, we're going to look at the rural areas and the statistics there, which are going to be, again, if we drill down to features and then zero and then one more time to properties, we can see that the we have the min, mean, and max values for the rural areas uh, that are defined. So these are all of the statistics for these four polygons that we defined earlier. And again, I'm interested in the mean surface temperature, which is uh, 30.9. And then to calculate the surface urban heat island intensity, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, subtract the, the mean surface temperature urban from the mean surface temperature rural, and that will give us the surface urban heat island intensity. And the intensity of the heat island is the simplest quantitative indicator of the thermal modification imposed by a city uh, upon the geography on which it is situated. So this is a really quick way to be able to derive the uh, surface ur urban heat island intensity for your area of interest. Now the next code we're going to take a look at is going to look at the Landsat time series pixel, and we will go to that next. The next script we're going to look at will be calculating a time series graph for Landsat 8 and 9 at the pixel level. The first variable that we see divine is point, and that was generated by using the uh, drop a marker, uh, which is down here, a feature which is down in the map window. So we can click on that and we can drop a marker anywhere we want. I chose a built up area in northeast Washington, DC, but you can drop a marker anywhere you want. And once we have that, we can then define a new variable. Uh, we're actually going to have to rename that because it'll probably be a, a generic name like geometry. But once we have that, we can rename it to point, which will be the same nomenclature as we're using in the code here. And we'll define a new variable AOI for area of interest. And we'll take that point and we're going to buffer that by 30 meters. 30 meters is the spatial resolution of a Landsat pixel. If you were interested in buffering more than 30 meters, you could certainly do 60, 90, etc. It really depends on what level of analysis that you're trying to generate that time series graph of land surface temperature, because we're going to be taking the mean of this buffered pixel. But again, uh, it's really subjective depending on your level of analysis, and you can adjust the code, you can adjust this parameter to how you want for your own analysis. The next chunk of code is to set the base map as the satellite instead of the hybrid or map. Then we're going to set the map center on a longitude and latitude and use the 12 as the zoom level. Then we're going to uh, assign a variable for both Landsat 9 and Landsat 8 bands. And we're going to choose the bands for surface temperature and the quality assessment pixel. And then we're going to assign new names for those bands that we're going to use later in the script. That is variable we're defining is band name. And instead of surface temper underscore B10, we'll rename that as just ST for surface temperature, and we'll keep the QA pixel 
band name as it is. Here we will be using the same function, the cloud mask function we used in the previous script to remove any cloudy or cloud shadow pixels. So we're only going to be doing analysis, a time series analysis on uh, cloud free and cloud shadow free pixels. Then we will create variables L9 and L8 to take the image collection, the Landsat 9 Collection 2 Tier 1 Level 2 image collection and select just the bands, the, the land surface temperature and the quality assessment pixel. And we're going to filter it by the point, the area of interest, that point, and then also apply that cloud mask. And we'll do that for both Landsat 9 and Landsat 8 collections so that we're working with pixels that actually have values that we're interested in. Then we're going to create two new variables to pass the filtered collection into, and we're only going to collect scenes from that collection that have cloud cover that is less than 20% total in the scene that we're trying to gather. If you are in an area, say, more tropical latitudes that experience more cloud cover, you will probably have to change this parameter to something higher than 20 just so you can get scenes that will have pixels of value that you can use. So this is very dependent on where your urban area is located. So again, these are parameters that you will have to change and adjust for your own study area. Then we're going to use print statements to print the output to the console so that we can do a gut check and make sure that our code is actually running the way we want it to. Next thing we're going to do is concatenate the names of the bands. So we want to take the surface temperature underscore with the, the name, so either L8 or L9. That way when we generate the graph, we have a, a nicely worded graph that has both Landsat and Landsat 8 and 9 concatenated for um, just for consistency purposes. And next thing we're going to do is uh, merge the collections together. So this chunk of code here is taking the filtered Landsat 9 and Landsat 8 collections based on that one location. This is the entire collection, so we haven't filtered anything by date. These are all the images that are in both collections and they're cloud free and they have good quality pixels and we're going to merge them. So instead of having two separate collections, we'll just have one collection, which we're naming uh, Landsat Collection, uh, Landsat Cole. And that way, when we do a time series, we just have uh, uh, all of the Landsat 9 and 8 together in one collection. Then we're going to use uh, create a function, same function as we used in the previous code, to apply scale factors to generate both uh, uh, both the temperature in Kelvin and then also uh, actually just into from Kelvin into degrees Celsius, uh, which is the uh, degree Celsius is what I'm most interested in. But depending on your analysis, you can do uh, either or. And then we're going to uh, define a new variable to apply those scale factors to that merged image collection. And then again, we're going to use a print statement just to make sure that everything is working as I would like it to. And lastly, we're going to create a new variable time series. And in that time series, we're going to create a line, uh, um, a line chart. And we're going to give that chart a title and give the vertical axis a title and a horizontal axis a title. And we will be passing in that merged collection of land surface temperature, which is buffered to this one point. And we're going to print that. And when I click Run, we'll see that all the collections from the print statements are now generated in the console. And we also have, I can pop this out into a different tab, we also have the time series of that merged collection of Landsat 8, which is depicted in blue, and Landsat 9, which are these red dots uh, on the, uh, the right-hand side of the graph. Landsat 8 launched in, in 2013, so we can start seeing some of the uh, land surface temperature from that buffered pixel. And then we can also see, because Landsat 9 launched in 2021, that starting in that year, we're starting to get some of the land surface temperature from those years as well. So this is a really useful way to be able to graph out the land surface temperature for the Landsat collection. You could take this back farther if you wanted to into Landsat, say Landsat 7, Landsat 5, and 4. I chose to use Landsat 8 and 9 because the sensor, the thermal infrared sensor, is comparable between the two, and it's uh, appropriate to use for a level analysis these two sensors uh, together. But that is uh, the second script that we're using to show you how to derive a time series for any given location that you're interested in. 
And the last script that I'm going to be walking you through is based on the MODIS sensor on the Aqua satellite. And that will be the third uh, script that we'll walk through right now. We'll be using the same geometry imports that we used in previous scripts for area of interest, rural, and urban polygons. You can see they've been imported here at the top of the script. And then also we have a commented section telling what the script does. And then here are the parameters that you'll need to change in the script to adapt this code to your area of interest. This first chunk of code is setting the date range by day of year, as well as year range, uh, as well as defining the study bounds, and then also setting, defining a variable. So anytime we pass this variable into the code below, it will appear in the map window. We're also centering the map window on the study bounds, and then also setting the satellite view as the default base map. This next chunk of code is creating a function and we're defining that function by the variable get QC bits. And this chunk of code that creates the function is computing the QC bits that we want to extract. These QC bits are flag values in each pixel that define pixels that have cloud or cloud shadow, or that are flagged for land surface temperature error that we do not want to use later in our analysis. So it's going to pull those, <clears throat> those QC bits out that we want to extract. And this get QC bits we're actually going to be using in this function that we're defining here and this function that we're that we're defining by the name of mask qc this function is going to use the get qc bits function and actually mask out any of the flagged land surface temperature uh, uh, values that have an error or that have cloud or cloud shadow and once we have that function defined we're going to define a variable to get the aqua modus image uh, collection and filter that by the date range, the year range, and then apply that mask to mask out any of the, uh, the flag values for land surface temperature error or by cloud or cloud shadow. And then we're going to print the output to the console window. Next, we're going to define a variable for nighttime land surface temperature in Celsius. And we're going to apply scale factors to derive the pixel in degrees centigrade. And we're going to rename the band uh, LST night one kilometer to LST night underscore C, which stands for land surface temperature at night for Celsius. And once we have that band renamed and rescaled to degree centigrade, we're going to do the same for the land surface temperature in daytime. We're going to use this. Um, we're going to use this function to create use the scale factors to derive degrees and centigrade, and then we're going to rename that band LSTD underscore C for land surface temperature in the daytime at in centigrade. And then this chunk of code is going to uh, plot a histogram for the number of pixels uh, per location at night that have uh, those land surface temperature values. This chunk of code is going to do the same thing. It's going to provide a count of land surface temperature values per pixel during the daytime. And then this chunk of code is going to calculate the average nighttime land surface temperature per pixel across the image collection, and then we're going to print that to the console window. That way we have uh, land surface temperature, uh, the average throughout the entire collection. And then we're going to do the same thing for the daytime. We're going to take the entire collection from 2010 to 2022, filter to the months of July and August, and we're going to take the average uh, for the land surface temperature across that collection. Next, we're going to uh, print uh, the histogram for those land surface temperature values at nighttime, and we're going to clip it to the study bounds, and we're only going to be selecting that, uh, the nighttime land surface temperature in centigrade, and then we're going to print a histogram so we can view those values in the console window. We're also going to do the same thing by plotting histogram values that have been clipped to the study bounds, and we're only going to be selecting the land surface temperature in the daytime and centigrade, and then we're going to print that histogram again to the console window. This next chunk of code is deriving statistics for the mean, min, and max, uh, and we're going to der be deriving those statistics for the urban area that we delineated, that urban polygon. So it'll take the mean, min, and max for that urban core, and then we're also going to do the same thing, uh, and that's going to be for the uh, mean, min, and max for the urban area, and this is going to be at nighttime. Then we're going to derive the statistics for the mean, min, and max for the rural part of Washington, D.C. at nighttime, so that we can derive the uh, surface urban heat island intensity, similar to we did in the previous script. And we're also going to print both of those outputs to the console window. 
Next, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to be uh, driving statistics for mean, min, and max, except this time it's going to be for the daytime, and it's going to be uh, uh, for the uh, rural areas, uh, I'm sorry, for the urban, and then in this case, we're going to be doing the same thing, deriving mean, min, and max for the rural areas in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then we're also going to print that to the console window so that we can view the statistics. And then we're going to add those map layers based on uh, the land surface temperature at night and land surface temperature at daytime. And we'll add both of those to the map window. So I'll go ahead and click Run. And we can take a look at the console. And you can see that the map window automatically panned to the uh, the uh, area of interest that we defined before and it's also generating see the layers are still generating but we can start looking at some of the results in the console window so we can see that the uh, we have a histogram here of land surface temperature the number of pixels of land surface temperature uh, per location at night and we also have a histogram of the number of uh, land surface temperature pixels per location in the daytime and then we also have the output of the uh, the mean of the collection at nighttime as well as the mean uh, across the day. And then we also have a histogram of the uh, land surface temperature values at nighttime. So this is the, the, the range of values at night. And then also those range of values of land surface temperature in the daytime. Again, all of these histograms can be uh, popped out into a different tab to be able to view them uh, at a larger scale. And then lastly, we have statistics. This is the, uh, the mean, min, and max of land surface temperature for urban Washington, D.C. at night, and then the statistics for mean, min, and max for rural Washington, D.C. at night. And so if we wanted to calculate the surface urban heat island, we would uh, subtract the rural uh, land surface temperature at nighttime from the daytime. And to get those values, we can drill down from feature collection to features to zero to properties, and then we can see here that the uh, land surface temperature at night for the mean is 21.7 degrees. And again, this is for the um, for urban Washington, D.C. And then if we want to get the same thing for rural Washington, D.C. at nighttime, we can drill down and we can get the mean here that we calculated earlier in the script. And this is going to be for, uh, again, this is for the nighttime rural part of Washington, D.C. So we would subtract this value from this value here to get the surface urban heat island intensity at nighttime. And then we also have the statistics here for the uh, mean, min, and max for urban and rural, but this time during the day. So this allows us to generate the surface urban heat island for both daytime and nighttime using the Aquamodus instrument. And then this commented code here at the bottom just explains what I just walked through here in terms of getting those different bands and doing these different equations to have a, uh, an intensity of uh, surface urban heat island as a quantitative indicator of the ther thermal modification of a city imposed upon the geography in which it is situated. So these are three scripts to be able to derive uh, time series analysis of land surface temperature, as well as to derive surface urban heat island intensity using the Aquamodus instrument, as well as using the uh, Landsat missions as well. So now that I've walked through both, uh, all three of the scripts, the, we're going to give you some lab time to be able to work with those scripts on your own, and we will be waiting here to answer any questions that you have as you walk through the scripts. So again, we're giving you roughly 30 minutes to be able to go through those scripts on your own, change the parameters for your own area of interest, and if you have any questions in the next 30 minutes, please do let us know, and we'll be here to answer the questions as they come in. So we're now giving this time to you to work on uh, calculating your own land surface temperature for your area of interest. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. We've been getting some terrific questions, but if you haven't already, please do enter your questions in the Q&A box. We will answer them in the order that they were received. We might not get through all of the questions today, but we will answer the questions offline and we will post the Q&A doc to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Below is the contact information for myself, as well as my colleague, Dr. Amita Mekta, and we've also provided links to the training webpage and the RSET website.
Well, we want to thank everybody that's been submitting your questions. We've gotten a lot of really great questions. And so again, we're going to try to get through as many as possible in the next 10 minutes. But uh, fear not, we will answer all of them and we will hope to get this up and posted on the training page within the next couple of days. So again, if we don't get through all of your questions today, don't worry, you will be able to find the answer uh, sometime later this week. So to get into it, uh, question number one is, uh, why Modus Aqua and not also uh, Terra? And the answer being uh, that the Modus instrument on the Terra satellite only provides land surface temperature estimates during the daytime. Uh, so if we want to assess urban heat islands uh, at nighttime, it's important uh, that we use the Aqua Modus instrument uh, because it provides products for both daytime and nighttime. And that is very useful because a lot of products that you find are, especially land surface temperature, only provide uh, these uh, land surface temperature products during the day. And if we want to calculate or assess urban heat island, especially during the nighttime, which is very valuable because uh, a lot of times urban heat island effects are more pronounced uh, during the nighttime when the surrounding rural areas cool off uh, quite quickly uh, due to the uh, radiative properties of natural vegetation, uh, lakes and suburban areas versus the more built up urban area that it's very valuable to use the uh, land surface temperature from the MODIS instrument from the Aqua satellite. Another good uh, reason to use Aqua is because the local overpass time for the Terra satellite uh, is 1030 local time Whereas with the Aqua mission, uh, the MODIS instrument on the Aqua mission has a local overpass at 1330. And if we're interested in urban heat island effects, typically, not always, but typically, uh, land surface temperature will be higher in the afternoon. So the Aqua mission is better suited uh, for this analysis. Uh, question number two, uh, how did you import Landsat to script section? So, I wasn't exactly sure what this question was asking, but if you were trying to access the code, uh, we did provide links to you uh, in the chat as well as uh, within the PDF that we're sharing from today's presentation. So please try to access the script from there. Uh, if you're having trouble, make sure that you've created a Google Earth Engine account uh, using either your Gmail or a .edu email address. And uh, please do refer to the commented sections for each uh, of the uh, areas of the code. Hopefully they were commented well enough to understand what each section of code is doing. But if you are still having uh, problems, then uh, do feel free to reach out to me and, and we can see if we can't troubleshoot uh, whatever issue you're having. Question number three. Hi all, it is fantastic that the code is well commented. However, is there any documentation for the library that is being used? So for all the code that we provided in JavaScript, we use the library of functions that come with the Google Earth Engine API. And if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're more, uh, if you want more information on any of the functions that were used, uh, you can refer to the documentation, which is under the Docs tab for each of the uh, different functions that we applied for for each of the three scripts. Uh, and you can find that uh, the Docs tab is on the left hand side of the code editor. So hopefully that answered. Uh, the question number three. Uh, question number four, if we change the AOI, uh, area of interest, by delineating our own rectangle, do we have to recalculate the latitude, longitude for the uh, the function to set the map center, which is map.setCenter? Uh, and then I suppose otherwise the map display pans to Washington, D.C. all the time. And that is correct. Uh, whenever you change the bounding box, that rectangle, using the draw rectangle tool for your own area of interest, then you will need to edit the longitude and latitude degrees. And you might have to edit the zoom extent as well, depending on how big or small your, your urban area of interest is. But you will need to change those parameters uh, for the longitude and latitude whenever you do change uh, the bounding box, that rectangle, and rename it. Uh, to AOI, standing for area of interest. Question number five, the script uses the thermal band, which is heat reflected. What about surface emissivity for Landsat? Does that not contribute to the urban heat island? And so one of the surface temperature, temperature auxiliary inputs for Landsat surface temperature is a global emissivity data set. And that data set, uh, which is uh, input into the surface temperature algorithm is derived 
from the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer. Uh, it's an ASTRA instrument, and that is uh, flown on the Terra satellite. So surface emissivity does influence urban heat island development. Uh, it's a measure of surfaces' ability to shed heat uh, or emit long wave radiation. Uh, we focused uh, just solely on the land surface temperature alone for deriving surface even urban heat island intensity. We did not get into uh, any uh, uh, influences of, of emissivity, but that's certainly something that, that you could look into. We were trying to keep it to uh, analysis ready products that you can get uh, right in in Earth Engine and start uh, doing analysis and start running applications. So that is one of the reasons. But uh, but there is an emissivity auxiliary data set that is included in the algorithm to derive the surface temperature. Question six: Is there some standard criteria slash methodology to determine the extension of rural area with respect to the urban area, or which is a proportion suggested? How do you define the area areas to use as your rural and urban for the calculation of surface urban heat island intensity? This is a really great question. Uh, we got several questions related to this. And so hopefully by answering them, uh, we will touch upon the questions that were similar that other people had asked. But uh, for the for urban areas, most people have it's pretty consistent approach to to identifying and delineating urban areas. These are pretty much classified as built up land uh, and land cover maps, uh, as well as uh, for, for urban areas. So if you do have access to land cover maps, or if you can uh, if you can run an analysis on land surface temperature, typically those those higher temperature values that you will find will be, especially in, in, in a city, will be derived from built up uh, impervious surfaces. So if you don't have access to a land cover map, a, uh, a a good accurate good <coughs> excuse me good quality land cover map that is one way to go about delineating urban areas. But if you do have access to a land cover map, then you can certainly use that to help delineate the um, those areas. <clears throat> Google Earth Engine does provide uh, global land cover maps. Uh, some of them at 10 meter uh, spatial re resolution. Those are derived from the uh, Sentinel two mission from the European Space Agency. So for those that are looking for land cover maps, I do suggest looking through the, the geospatial data sets through Earth Engine to, to help find those. But to get back to the, the question though, to delineate rural areas in relation to urban areas, there are a number of different methodologies. Uh, I would, none of them are standardized, so I can't speak that anyone is the definitive way. Uh, some have used different buffering uh, methods. So once you have that urban core delineated, either through your own knowledge of your city or from using land cover maps that you are getting through some other product through other agencies, uh, some uh, some methods uh, apply buffer zones from that urban core, and that buffer zone can vary, and that can vary depending on your area of interest. Um, different cities have different suburban sprawl, so that will impact how you delineate your rural areas. And those buffer zones can range from one to 50 kilometers. So there is no standard approach. In the example provided in the script, obviously we delineated rural areas uh, based on natural and suburban characteristics. That's just from my own knowledge of Washington DC, which is the city in which I live. But for your own area of interest, uh, it could be, uh, you will have to place great care in how you select the traits that you want to characterize urban versus rural. And we will provide some links to different literature publications that have applied different approaches. And we'll certainly give those links before we post this to the, the training page. So question number seven, uh, what does the point buffer do? Does the higher buffer mean a higher analysis area? Uh, that is correct. So anytime you uh, buffer the area or increase the uh, the spatial scale of that buffer in meters, then you are buffering to a larger uh, area of analysis. So, so that is correct. So if you if you wanted say a 60 meter buffer or a 100 meter buffer or a, a 120 meter buffer, then yeah, you would be doing an analysis on that greater area, depending on the uh, the value of the buffer that you assigned. Uh, question eight: Is the time of day equal across all images? So for all, for no, I can't say for for nearly all of NASA missions, the local overpass time will be the same. 
So for most sun-synchronous orbiting satellites, uh, and sun-synchronous being the Aqua satellite, the, all of the Landsat missions are sun-synchronous, they have the same local overpass time for all the imagery collected for that local, for the area of your interest. So, so, the, so the time of day will be the same for, for, for example, given in the Landsat 8 analysis that we conducted, yes, it will be, as well as for the Aqua mission. There are some NASA missions where the, uh, the local overpass time will not be the same. Uh, one of those that I'm, th well, several I'm thinking of are anything that is, might be on the International Space Station, because that does not have uh, a consistent uh, repeat time. It has the same orbital swath, but the repeat time and the time of day will vary depending on when the imagery is collected. Uh, I am being mindful of the time, and I noticed that it is one minute after the uh, the time. So we will wrap up here, but I will say, and I will repeat, that for all the questions, and we got some wonderful questions, that we will be getting to all of them, and we will be answering and posting them to the question and answer uh, document, and we will post that on the training page. Hopefully, we're, we're shooting for by the end of this week, so that it will be ready uh, before uh, the part three, uh, which will start next Tuesday. So again, we're having uh, you know part two is, is gonna be in two days. Um, so we will post this, we will get through all the questions. We wanna thank everybody for submitting your questions. And we also wanna thank everybody for joining today. Uh, this is a really important topic. Uh, understanding the urban heat island phenomenon is only going to uh, become more important uh, through climate change, and then also being to the ability to be able to characterize and also help mitigate the effects of the urban heat island for those most vulnerable is precisely the topic that we will be covering in part two of this training of this webinar series. Again, part two will be in two days on Thursday. It will be at the same time. We hope that you will all join us where we will be able to start learning in part two and then continuing into part three on how you can use different socioeconomic variables to start creating your, your own heat vulner, vulnerability indices to help mitigate the effects of what we were characterizing in today's training, which is calculating the surface urban heat island intensity. So I want to thank the RSET team that helped to make this possible. That's Selwyn hudson Odoy, Jonathan O'Brien, Sarah Cutshaw, and Brock Blevins as well as my colleague, Amit Demekta. So thank you to the RSET team. And again, I wanna thank everybody for joining today. And we hope to see you all again on Thursday for part two of the webinar series. Thank you.